My name is Blade Marsh. I work for the NRCS in Sheridan. And we got to thinking about outreach and education needs for people in our county. And one of the holes that we all know and realize is that most of our education goes towards traditional agricultural production. And there's a significant amount of landowners in Madison County growing every day that aren't from that field. They're not from agriculture, but they have bought property here. They have acreage and they don't know what they don't know, or maybe they're just interested in learning more. So we put together this workshop, never been done before, tried to bring together as many resources as we could under one roof for one workshop. And uh, just thank you for coming. There's snacks back here, have at it. There's handouts, lots of different handouts behind you on those tables and in the back corner. Um, bathrooms are out the double doors and down the hall to the left. Most of the questions will be at the end of the workshop. We're going to have a Q&A panel. If a presenter gets done in time to let you ask a few questions, try to keep them focused on what they actually presented and short enough that we can stay within that 15 minute time window for a presentation. With that, I'm going to introduce our facilitator for this event, which is Helena Miller. She is uh, Madison and Jefferson County's extension agent and a wonderful resource for lots of your land use questions. Please. Thanks, Clayton. So I'm Clayton Miller, um, work for MSU Extension, Madison and Jefferson Counties, Covenant Ag and Natural Resources and Horticulture. Um, Clayton did a great job just introducing this workshop and why we're here. I just want to frame it. We have two main goals for tonight, and one is to introduce you to or familiarize yourself with the content that our speakers are covering tonight. Um, these are the questions that as local agencies we're getting a lot of recently. Um, it's not exhaustive, so we definitely want to be here for other topics you have to inform programming in the future. Um, the second goal is to connect you with your local resource agencies. So that's the second part. When the presenters are done, we'll break and have a larger Q&A panel with some local folks because um, we want you to know who we are and how you can use us as resources. Does that sound good? Okay. So we will introduce our first speaker, Julie Cunningham. She's from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and she's going to cover wildlife yes. and your Thank you. A uh, pleasure to be here. I'm Julie. I work with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. I'm based in Bozeman, but uh, we have a lot of small acreages there, so I'm giving just a 10,000-foot overview. We have about 15 minutes, but we can certainly get into more depth later in the Q&A. Um, as you guys know, the Madison's a beautiful place where there's diverse wild species. These photographs are from a local photographer who lives in the Madison Valley as well. Wildlife need food water, shelter, and space. And they can find that even on small acreages. Small acreages can be really important to, uh, to wildlife. Um, on your small acreages, the four things I'm really gonna go over in this presentation, but we can talk about anything you want later, is uh, for first, don't feed the wildlife. And now, many of you may be native here and you may already know that Montana has laws and rules about that, but not everybody does. So I'm gonna talk about how important it is not to feed wildlife. Um, just gonna have a slide or two on bear safety. Uh, that's been a really hot topic in the Bozeman area for sure, but Madison County uh, folks uh, may run into um, bear challenges too. Uh, we're gonna talk about the importance of hunting to keep wildlife populations healthy, happy, and balanced and to prevent damage to neighboring farmers and ranchers. And we'll talk about wildlife friendly fence, which will, uh, the purpose of that is to allow wildlife to, be, to move, to connect their populations, to connect winter and summer ranges, to, to be able to have the movement corridors that they need uh, to live and survive. So we'll go through all that. Whoops. Yep. Okay, so first is don't feed wildlife. Um, Sometimes in really bad winters, if you guys have been around um, egg for a while, you'll know that um, wildlife get, have the, like ungulates will get feed, the hooked animals will have microbes in their stomach that are particularly adjusted for dry food because it's winter. And if you feed something too hot, too green, too sweet, they can actually get ulcers and die. So, so there's proximate, don't, you know, don't feed wildlife for that reason, but there's also 
Um, it can concentrate animals. Some animals can pass diseases. Many of you guys in Madison County are probably are aware of chronic wasting disease and the importance of not feeding deer because congregating deer can cause uh, worse concerns with uh, chronic wasting disease. But also, if you have you know an area where you're lucky enough to have bighorn sheep, we don't want them congregating and potentially passing respiratory diseases. In Bozeman, we have a big problem with new people coming into the area and feeding deer, which attracts predators to their uh, landscapes. And we have mountain lions in neighborhoods because people think the deer are pretty and they feed them and then the lions come in and they don't like that. Um, feeding can habituate animals, getting them to be not afraid of people. And uh, they can allow too many to live and to reproduce, causing overpopulation and damage. The next thing you know, we have suburban or exurban deer uh, problems. And it is illegal in Montana to feed any game animals, including turkeys. That was a new addition to the feeding statute because turkeys can get damaging. Some of you may have had experience with that. Uh, being bear safe is important, and uh, sometimes folks don't think about other sources that attract bears out of the hills, especially in these dry years. Fruit trees, keep them picked clean. Up in the uh, uh, Kalispell area, there was a lot of outreach this year, and volunteers going just sweeping up any leftover apples and crab apples, things like that, to just keep keep them picked up. You have, well, electric fence them if you need to. Uh, fruit trees are big attractants. <clears throat> Uh, keeping your garbage secured until pickup is really important and using bear resistant facilities if at all possible. But also consider you know leaving pet food out, uh, gardens, um, barbecue grills, compost, unless it's limited to leaves and grass, they can all be attractants to bears. Uh, if you're in a place where you have your own livestock, there's um, often livestock disposal services. Uh, I can't speak a lot to that. I wanted to catch our bear people and really learn. I'm an ungulate person, I'm a hoofed animal person. But we have bear staff who are specialties uh, in bears. Uh, and I know that they would know about carcass removal programs, but they're all out trapping bears right now. So I couldn't get a hold of them before today. But if you email me, we can uh, we could talk more about bear uh, livestock carcass removal programs. As mentioned, I was going to talk about the importance of allowing hunting, even on small acreages. You can hunt them safely and it will really help your neighbors. This is a photo of a whole bunch of mule deer in on a haystack. And so if you, some of you guys have been in the ag community for a long time, you know what kind of damage to store feed. You know how much feed costs for your horses and you know how much of that feed deer and elk can take unless those, uh, those bales are, are secured. But uh, working together as a community to manage wildlife populations is so important because even on small acreages, wildlife can hide during the day and then go to a neighbor's farm at night and cause a substantial amount of damage to crops or, or stored feed. So, um, I mean, again, and we've got CWD in the area, chronic wasting disease. We have brucellosis in the area. We To protect our farming and ranching communities, I really encourage you to consider allowing hunting on your small uh, properties. Um, we'll talk about how to do this uh, safely. On small acreages, <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, I try to keep it interesting because it's, you know. <laughs> um, you you can consider setting up uh, blinds, you know, a small acreage I hunt, um, I'm up in a barn shooting down and that helps keep it safe. It's only a 14 acre place, whitetail move below it, it's got a safe backdrop. You can consider setting up hay bale blinds, shooting lanes, anything to try to encourage folks, you know, that if you allow people on your property to just be like, okay, you know, one person a day, you sit here and shoot that way is a way to keep people safe in a subdivision or environment where there's other households around and still get the population harvest we need to prevent the kind of damage that we can see if, if hunting doesn't happen. Remember that just because a hunting district allows rifle harvest, you as a private landowner have all the authority in the world to tell uh, anybody who comes onto your land, no, I want you to use archery only, or I want you to use shotgun only, weapon restriction, if you need to, if you feel like that's important for safety. Um, you can always limit the number of parties a day. You can have safety zones. And remember, you guys can enforce rules and lean on FWP to, to help. Um, even a small acreage, you can consider enrolling in block management. It brings extra rules and enforcement and signage and support and uh, a financial 
return to landowners who enroll in block management. So even small landowners can be uh, considered in block management. It's an access program, FWP manages. And remember the number 1-800-TIPMOT report violations, any type of uh, unethical hunting that you see or um, any uh, trespass issues, that's a call center. And so they'll go to our game wardens who are, who are on staff. And then wildlife friendly fences, I've got a few slides to talk over them uh, on your on your guys's property. Please consider removing any wire you don't need every year. We get deer and elk and even moose tangled in wires and Christmas lights. And, um, you know, sometimes it can really, really kind of damage a critter. So if you have um, loose wire, uh, you can. There are groups of folks and volunteers that will help come clean that up and sometimes you'll find in the community. Otherwise, uh, but just consider removing any fence you don't need. Keeping your fence in good repair uh, will really help prevent entanglements. Um, wildlife friendly fence is a smooth bottom wire because if you think about our pronghorn in this valley, uh, the Madison Valley and over um, in the Ruby, the pronghorn have um, really uh, fragile hollow hairs and barbed wire can really rip their skin. So a smooth bottom wire helps them pass at least 18 inches from the ground, helps elk calves, deer fawns, pronghorn get underneath it. Um, you can consider adding rails or crossings specifically for wildlife passage. Lay down fences, I'll show you a diagram of that in a minute, what that looks like. And uh, during winter, if you don't have cows or horses in your guys' pastures, consider leaving gates open because wildlife will find gates if they're not pushed. If they're pushed, they panic and run into anything. But if they're not pushed, they'll find open gates and that can help. Oh, and I meant to tell you guys, this guide, I brought a few copies, it's in the back, but there aren't a whole lot of print copies left. It is available online and I left a bunch of my cards there and I can email you a PDF or you can find it at this web address, which is a long address. You can get it from this uh, PowerPoint, uh, but there's a couple of copies I brought. So here's some examples from the book. This is a good wildlife friendly fence. Up on top, you can actually put a little PVC post. And if you guys have driven Highway 84 by Black's Ford, there's a landowner who has this and she loves it because the elk cross there all the time. And uh, it keeps them from breaking that top wire. Uh, oftentimes an elk will jump a fence and snag a hoof on that top wire and then it wraps down to one of the lower wires and then that's how it gets stuck. So it protects it from breaking, protects the elk and it's high visibility. So if you're in a sage grouse area, that's safe for sage grouse too. Um, and then you notice the smooth bottom wire. This is an example of the, if you're in a pronghorn area, you can staple up a bottom wire who allows pronghorn to swoosh underneath. This is a lay down fence. It's kind of, these are kind of slick. Uh, in, the, in this area, the Granger Ranch has some of these. It's kind of a suspension fence with poles and you lift it up and you loop it onto um, existing posts in the ground. And it uh, um, will, it's easy to pick up and lay down. So if you find that your fences break a lot in winter because of wildlife, you can do a trick like this and they don't break it as bad. Um, if you're in a very small land ownership, I know this is expensive, but, uh, you know, you can consider post and rail and again, making it high um, or using smooth wires, something like that around your, your house or yard will still allow good wildlife passage without the entanglement hazard. There's other resources to help. I mentioned uh, groups of people who might be able to help remove wires, especially if it's in the connectivity area. A lot of this is uh, non-governmental agencies. Um, have all banded together to try to uh, encourage wildlife friendly fencing in the Madison County because uh, there's some pretty great migration corridors here, whether it's elk or pronghorn or deer. And so a lot of non governmental agencies are really, really interested in helping National Parks Conservation Association, Greater Yellowstone Association, Nature Conservancy can all maybe help bring resources to help keep wildlife moving. And then I wanted to close with just a few other wildlife topics, kind of the calls we get all the time at fish, wildlife and parks. Um, a few things just to mention, even on small acreages, you know, um, controlling pets, feral cats can cause a lot of damage to migratory birds. Um, loose dogs uh, chasing wildlife, it is illegal under state law. So watch your, watch your dogs. Um, moose abound, and you, some of you guys may, if you're looking at the Calistra area, in this area, I, I don't know over in Sheridan, but 
Um, we get a lot of moose calls. We won't move a moose unless it's like human safety risk. Just a moose being a moose, we're gonna leave it alone. So if you have a moose in your area, call your local biologist and we'll talk about being moose safe. But the reason we don't just come and, and move it somewhere else is they're really hard to anesthetize safely. The drugs that we use can hurt the moose and, and can hurt people. So we usually try to get our wildlife veterinarian and there's like one of those in Bozeman to help us. We can use a cocktail of other drugs to try to anesthetize it, but there'll be risk to the moose. And then it requires six big people to lift the moose and put it into a trailer to move it somewhere else. We have to coordinate all of the people and the drug and be able to find the moose and be able to do this operation. So obviously if it's human safety, uh, we will respond immediately. If it's human safety and you can't reach FAP, call your county sheriff, call your, your local police department or something like that. If it's a human safety risk, like if it's an aggressive moose and you can't get FWP, um, we still need to do something about it. Moose can be very aggressive, but a lot of times they just are passing through. In Bozeman area, we had a moose living south of town and we checked on it quite a bit. It was beautiful, you know, two acre home sites with big trees and willows and open space. And that moose had the best habitat in the world in that little subdivision. Never did hurt a fly. Never. It's, some people were a little scared because there was a moose living there, but it, it moved on. And uh, that's what we would like to see. There was no reason we had to move that moose. Um, uh, this is a CWD deer. We've talked a lot about CWD. If you see sick wildlife, go ahead and call FWP's office. Um, we want to be on top. CWD is only one kind of disease. There's many others out there. You might run into mange. Um, you know, we actually found Yonis disease in a deer in the Jeffers area, which is a livestock disease. And I think it is the first time we found one of the deer in Montana with that. So you never know. Uh, happy to pick up sick wildlife, necropsy it. Um, so just let us know. And if you if you do have injured wildlife, we get a lot of calls about deer with broken legs. Deer can run pretty good on broken legs. And if it's still mobile, we're gonna let that go because um, you know, we don't need to go hunt down an animal that can run and eat and try to get away and live. Because it, it's amazing. They'll they can survive with a broken leg for years. So unless it's like not mobile. If it's if it's completely wrecked and not mobile and it needs to be euthanized, we'll come euthanize it. But we can't rehab deer, so just letting you know. That is the uh, end of my brief um, visit. I just wanted to let you guys know on the Bozeman area. So for the in the Madison, I go to the Madison River, uh, and then from the river west is your biologist Dean Walty. He's based in the Sheridan area, and his contact information's there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can uh, help with the Ennis, Jeffers, McAllister, uh, Cameron uh, communities. So that's my time. Thank you. Thank you. And so next we have Cody Markser and she's with Great West Engineering and she's going to be talking about streams on your property. Well, welcome everybody. I am Cody Markser and I am a land use planner for Great West Engineering. My history, I came from the Madison County side of planning, floodplain administration, I was also the former 310 specialist for the Madison Population District. So I deal with the regulation side of water, um, which I know many of you cringe at, but there is a purpose, I promise. So today we'll talk how you legally and ethically work with any water bodies on your property. This can include anything from streams to ponds to lakes, rivers, wetlands, um, irrigation ditches even, and then a little bit about floodplain development, because it's not always right along a river. So as far as streams, anything that requires permitting or review or evaluation regarding streams would be work that happens within the stream bed or along the stream banks or over at the top. So within the stream beds or stream banks, we often, often see things such as channel restoration, um, bank stabilization where we've seen a lot of erosion with high water. Also fish ladders being installed or culverts for road or bridge crossings. And then across streams, we also see elevated bridges and often in our community in Madison County, we do see elevated irrigation pipes above creeks and streams. But those also require permitting or at least evaluation. 
Um, we'll go through at the end of your different resources for the different types of permitting, but specific to streams, your best place to start is going to be with your conservation district, and then they can direct you to the next best steps from there. Ponds, we're seeing a lot of private fishing ponds coming onto small acreages in Madison County. Ponds haven't historically fit into a very black and white area, um, but there is a little bit of restriction in place. So if you are within a floodplain, you still need to have a floodplain development permit. And sometimes you even have to work through the US Army Corps to figure out where you're gonna get your water, sometimes Water Rights Bureau. But if you're gonna put in a private fishing pond or if you've got one on your property and you wanna stock it with fish, you'll need to connect with Fish, Wildlife and Parks to get those permits in place to get the correct fish in there. On lakes, we only have Ennis Lake in Madison County. And what projects we see primarily on lakes are boat docks, either temporary or permanent, and boat launches. Both of those fall within the jurisdiction of the Conservation District, Madison Conservation District, and require a 310 permit. Rivers, a lot of the same permitting that applies to streams applies to rivers. And often, if you're working along the Madison or the Ruby or the Beaverhead or the Baker Bowl, any of those, you are going to see duplicate permitting in place. Um, Big Hole, for example, has an extra layer of permitting, a Big Hole conservation permit. Um, usually with rivers, you're going to see floodplain permit, maybe a 310, maybe even the Big Hole conservation permit, maybe even a 318 authorization. You're going to see lots of things that work together. Um, to basically cover all the bases, but types of projects that we often see on rivers would be fishing access points, either pedestrian or trail. Also, boat launches, um, at least the desire to have a boat launch, those are less likely to happen anymore. Bank stabilization or erosion control, especially along roadways, um, that's pretty common. And bridge crossings, obviously, and then also floodplain development. A lot of times we'll talk more about floodplain development, but um, you can pretty much bet that if you're along the Madison, the Ruby, the Beaverhead, Big Hole, you're gonna have to deal with some floodplain work at some point, depending how close you are. Wetlands, so wetlands, <clears throat> they don't always have to be attached to a body of water. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Sometimes they hover around just a high groundwater area. Sometimes they're around the base of a spring that you're unaware is there. So wetlands fall into the jurisdiction of the Army Corps. Some of them are delineated, meaning they're recognized as a wetland and some are not. Um, but we do see projects, a lot of your conservation district work is within wetlands um, as well as streams, but we see a lot of riparian area restoration, wetland creation or expansion for the health of the soil or a specific species community, improved access for wildlife, and then enhanced vegetative buffers. Irrigation ditches and canals. I don't think I need to say this, but it's prudent to do so. You can't take water from an irrigation ditch unless you have your water rights. Everyone knows this, right? <laughs> Even just letting your horse cruise out there and drink is not okay. So you need to check with DNRC. I would, that's the place to start to make sure your water rights are in place for any type of access to any irrigation ditch or irrigation canal. Um, if you want to do additional projects, this is pretty common, right? Because irrigation ditches, flows change, things of that nature. Projects we see, culverts for crossings, either four-wheeler crossings, pedestrian crossings, equipment. Um, we see headgate repair or improvement. We also see diversion repair improvement, um, bank stabilization, restoration. A lot of times at those head gates, we get a lot of erosion on either side at high water in the spring runoff. And then again, just making sure your irrigation water rights are in place. And we also see um, additional crossings in there. One thing on ditches and canals, they don't always fall into the jurisdiction of permitting. So they would have to be perennial, meaning that they have a little bit of flow in at least one access point year round. And a little bit of flow, I'm talking it can be little, but that has to flow year round for it to be a jurisdictional 
ditch for permitting, but regardless, I always encourage you to start with your conservation district and they can point you in the right direction. So floodplain development, I could talk to you about this for days on end, um, but I won't, no worries. So floodplain development, um, I know sometimes permitting and regulations can seem really overreaching. Floodplain development is one, the regulations are in place really to protect property and people. So if you think of it in the case that you've got a waterway, we may not for 100, 200 years see that water ever get outside of the banks that we know. But in that one chance, that 500 year flood event, they call it 500 year, which is not very realistic, but that means it's like massive. Um, when we see those 500 year flood events, that water goes to places that we can't really always determine ahead of time. We can get a really good idea of where it might go based on topography, altitude, base flood elevations, things of that nature. So sometimes when you look at a floodplain map, it doesn't make a lot of sense why, well, there's a property that's literally 10 feet off the bank that's not in the floodplain, but mine is 10 miles away and it is. That's all based on that engineering and those LIDAR studies trying to determine where's that water gonna go first. It doesn't always flow where we think. Um, those maps are determined by DNRC and FEMA that come in and perform those studies decide where those areas are, and then the county or your local jurisdiction will take that, approve and adopt those maps and attach the regulations for development into those. The purpose of that is if you put a new structure in the middle of a flood plain or a flood way, and we haven't accounted for that structure, even just a 10 by 10 building will divert that water places it shouldn't go. And that can cause real havoc for people that it should never see water at their house. So that's the whole point of floodplain development and floodplain permitting. <clears throat> um, we'll talk a little bit about compliance after the fact here. There are differences in temporary versus permanent structures within these floodplain permits and development, um, and then also improvements. But really, if you're doing anything outside of your original footprint of the building that's existing today, you need to have it reviewed by your local floodplain administrator to make sure that you're good to go on doing whatever it is you need to do. Typically, it does. if you're in a floodway or a flood, not a floodway, but in a flood plain, it doesn't mean you can't develop, put up structures. It just means you're gonna have to maybe build those up or put in some flood proof venting to allow the water to flow through instead of around what you've got. So this chart, is taken right out of the DNRC guide to stream permitting. There's some copies available in the back. This is a handy booklet that you can flip through and identify where am I doing my project and what permits might apply. It doesn't mean they all will, but which ones may. And it tells you where to go and who to contact to look at those permits and see if they apply to you. Um, we'll talk about compliance on this slide here. So. I know a lot of times it's a beg for forgiveness after the fact deal, and I, I kudos to you that if that's worked for you in your life, it's never worked for me. Um, I'm a rule follower, so, you know. Um, <laughs> compliance on any of these permits, it can vary, so, or non-compliance, I should say. Um, it could be as little as a fine, and that fine could be substantial, or it could be what some consider minimal. It's all relative, I suppose. But that would be the minimum you'd be facing is a fine if you were to do a project and it was found out without the proper permitting in place. Um, but like it can go as high as with floodplain, for example, in this county specifically, we have had folks build a structure and they've had to tear it down and rebuild it to specs at their own cost. So, and pay a fine on top of it. Typically with anything water permitting related, if there is a non-compliance issue, the Army Corps is gonna get involved. Um, and it becomes a little bit of a bigger issue at that point. So any work you plan to do, it's just always better to ask first and make sure, because sometimes it's, you may not need anything at all, but you don't know until you find out. So some resources locally here and places to start. Um, DNRC has a great flood and fire page that has to do with anything water permitting wise or water use wise as far as on your property water, not groundwater or wells. Um, and then also your Madison County Floodplain Administrator, currently that is Christy Harper. She's housed upstairs on the second floor. Um, she would be a great resource. 
Montana FWP Fisheries, Mike Duncan is here tonight. Sorry to call you out, but he's our local 318 guy on the Madison side. And then we work with the Dillon office on the Ruby side. And then, of course, your local conservation districts. So Ruby primarily in Madison County and Madison. And then you also, depending where you're at up north, you may work with the Jefferson CD as well. All right, that is me, and we'll do questions later if I need to have them. So our third presenter is Dr. Jane Mangold, and she is MSU Extension's Invasive Plant Specialist, and so she'll be talking about invasive and noxious weeds. Thank you, Kalina. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, we're going to talk about managing weeds, everybody's favorite topic, right? Everybody's got them, would like to have something else. So we're going to, I'm going to give you a real quick overview. You know, I've spent 25 years doing this and still don't have it figured out. But um, these are three things that I just want to briefly talk about tonight that I think are important, important points for you to know so you can go forward and know who to connect with and some important questions to ask. So definitions, um, you probably hear a lot of different definitions about different terms we use for weeds. So definitions and impacts, reasons why some of these plants become invasive, and then I'm just gonna quickly give an overview of integrated weed management, all right? So let's go with definitions. So there's been, you'll find a lot of definitions for weeds, right? Anyone in the group have a definite, how do you define a weed? <clears throat> a plant out of place. I don't know if I have that one here, but that's a very common one. Oh, a plant that's growing where it's not wanted. A plant out of place. That's from 1912. <laughs> <laughs> a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered. I like that one. I oh, think yeah. about spotted napweed and honeybees, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of debate about that. <clears throat> Those plants with harmful or objectionable habits, any plant we don't like, okay? So lots of definitions for weeds. Well, what makes a plant weedy? What do you, what do you observe about weedy plants on your property? They take over. They take over. Other thing, how do they take over? Why? I mean, do they have magical powers or? Yeah, they do. <laughs> They're opportunistic. Hard to Always. control. Hard to control. They they keep coming back. I heard something over here. Bullies. They're bullies. <laughs> well, so so I'm a plant scientist, right? And I try to think about like their biology, right? That allow them to do all these things you're talking about. Be hard to control, be a bully. They do, usually have, produce a lot of seeds. Okay, they're prolific seed producers. And those seeds, a lot of them can live a long time. Like field bindweed, they they did studies on field bindweed. The seeds can live 35 years. Spotted napweed, 12. Cheatgrass, only a couple. Thank goodness. They don't have any special envir environmental requirements for germination. I think, did you say they're opportunistic? Yeah, they kind of, hey, when the opportunity comes along, they're ready to go, okay? They emerge quickly. So once they germinate, they just emerge from the ground. And then they grow fast. They grow faster than our native species, all right? And they really do well in disturbed areas, okay? That's these bare spaces where they have an opportunity to colonize. So that's what we would define. Those are characteristics of plants that are typically thought of as being weedy. What about invasive? You've heard that term, right? What I just came from Helena two days invasive species summit talking about invasive. Well, invasive plants have all those same traits we just talked about, but two additional traits for invasive plants are that they have the ability to invade undisturbed areas and persist. So they might show up in a disturbed area first and get a foothold, but then they have this capacity to start creeping into places that aren't necessarily disturbed. Okay, they're invading. And then the other uh, definition that's often applied when we're talking about invasive plants is they can cause harm to natural or cultural resources, the economy and human health. Okay, so they have some measurable 
negative impact, okay? Weedy species, maybe not. They're just kind of a nuisance. What about a noxious weed? Okay, and this is what you've probably all heard about, right? And maybe you get bothered by your neighbors to control your noxious weeds. Well, these are non-native non plants. They're not native to Montana. Um, a lot of them aren't even native to North America. They're usually invasive, so they have that capacity to invade. They can form dense infestations. Was it you that mentioned they take over, mm -hmm. right? And they can render land unfit for ag, forestry, livestock, wildlife, or other beneficial uses, or they harm native plant communities. And that's the Montana Department of Ag's definition of a noxious weed. Now, here's where it gets interesting because, because these plants can do this, we have a county noxious weed control act in the state of Montana that says it's unlawful for you as a landowner to allow these species to reproduce on your property. So you should be doing something from a management perspective to keep them from reproducing and spreading, okay? Now, I think this is interesting because, like I said, I just came from this summit, and we're talking about a whole suite of other <clears throat> invasive species like feral pigs, quagga zebra mussels, emerald ash borer, and we don't necessarily have laws about some of these species. Why do, why do you think we have a law about noxious weeds? Any ideas? I don't know if there's an answer, but one of the reasons I think we have a law about noxious weeds is because they don't, they don't recognize property boundaries. Kind of like Julie was talking about, you know, I think, yeah, Julie was talking about animals don't really know whose property they're on, but weeds don't recognize property boundaries and they get around, they travel around. So I kind of wonder, if we have laws to control noxious weeds because it's about being a good neighbor. And it's not just a, you know, who is your next door neighbor or, you know, who has the next acreage over. I like to think about it being a good neighbor to our landscapes. And, you know, it includes <laughs> taking care of our habitat for wildlife, um, taking care of the back country, right? We're really concerned about noxious weeds moving into the back country, the, the Forest Service land, the BLM land, the wilderness areas, where it takes a lot of effort to get there and do anything about those species um, if, they, if they do make it to those places. So I think about it as being a good neighbor. Okay, so um, in Montana, we have 36 species on the state noxious weed list, all right, and five regulated plants. There's some slight differences there. And then we can also have county listed species. All right. So um, I put Madison and Jefferson County listed species up there. They include baby's breath, um, field scabious, and musk thistle. Did I get those right, Dale? The list is current, the one that I found. So, you know, there's a whole suite of species. You, luckily, you don't have all of these. <laughs> To worry about at one time, but just to give you a sense that, you know, there's about 40 species you would want to be paying attention to and seeing if they're on your property. Okay. The impacts, um, I, you know, I probably am not going to go over all of these. Um, we've already mentioned a lot of them when I was asking you about traits, um, but I will mention that some of these species are toxic to um, livestock. So if you have livestock, there's some species you need, there's some extra motivation there. There's a nice publication on that back table, um, poisonous plants in Montana and Wyoming. There's just a few copies, so, and I brought a few too, Kalina. So if that's something you're particularly concerned about, grab one of those. Okay, so why, why do these plants invade? There's a lot of theories out there, okay? And without getting too sciencey and plant ecology geek, person standing up here because this is like what I find really fascinating but you may not <laughs> why do they some of the theories are that these plants were brought here from other continents 
some intentionally, some accidentally, but none of their natural enemies were brought here. Those things that feed on them, mostly insects, right? And that's kind of the idea behind biocontrol. We actually go find the insects that feed on these. But, so they got here, but none of their natural enemies came to kind of keep them in check. Another idea is that they evolved with different neighbors, plant neighbors in their countries of or origin. And then when they come over here, they don't really know how to play nice. They're bullies. Who over here said bullies? They don't really know how to play nice with their new neighbors. Um, we have different, a lot of our weedy species come from Europe and Asia, where they've had different grazing pressures over the years, centuries actually. And when they come here, they, they're exposed to different grazing pressures that don't keep them in check. And then disturbance. I mean, it's <laughs> weeds go where we go, all right? Um, they make their living off, like thriving on disturbance. So just a few things there for you to think about, you know, if you're interested, why do some of these species do what they do and be so successful? Last few minutes I have, I'm just gonna briefly go over categories of weed management, okay? We probably go to herbicides first, and that's probably what most of you think about, positively or negatively, when it comes to controlling weeds. But I just want you to know that there's a lot of ways to manage weeds. Um, we call it integrated weed management. And the tools you use to manage weeds depends on a lot of things. And we don't have time to go over those, all of those tonight. But I just want to go over um, kind of these broad categories. We always encourage you to use a combination of tools to try to bring the, your weeds down to an acceptable level. Okay. You may not be in a place where you can completely eradicate, but hopefully you can get them, have a management plan that keeps them at an accept, um, acceptable level, okay? Prevention is the first thing I will mention. It's the, the best way to manage weeds is to never get them in the first place, okay? And the way you do that is by taking care of the good plants that you have and keeping them as competitive as possible. Uh, we're gonna talk about grazing management tonight, right? Um, limiting disturbance, using weed seed-free forage, um, building materials, washing vehicles and equipment, cleaning clothing, scouting for new weeds, and learning about weeds, okay? So that, um, another way you can manage weeds is with mechanical methods. So this is any sort of method that physically kills a weed or disrupts its growth. So you can yank it out of the ground, right? You can cut it off. You can till the ground, not usually used in um, pasture and range, but in crop systems. Um, so mechanical control, anything that causes physical harm. Chemical control, that's using a herbicide, right? And there's a lot of different considerations that go in to using a herbicide. I did bring some of these, they're on the back table, frequently asked questions about herbicides and noxious weeds, okay? Biological control, that's using one organism to control weeds, to control another organism. And this is the idea behind that um, weeds got here without their natural enemies. There's a whole suite of insects that have been developed to specifically attack some of our noxious weeds. Okay, people have been researching that and developing those for many years. You might also think of grazing as a type of biological control. So you can use targeted grazing to keep weeds from reproducing, right? And then the last one I'll mention is cultural control. And um, this, is, this is, cultural control is when you're doing things to manage your vegetation that um, focus on making the desired vegetation more competitive. So not so much about how can I kill this weed, but it's more like what can I do with my vegetation as a whole to make it more competitive against weeds. So things like fertilization, irrigation, revegetation falls into this type of weed control, planting something in place of the weed to try to um, 
compete with it. Uh, proper grazing, okay? So cultural control is the last one that I will mention. Now, like I said, I've been studying this for 25 plus years and still don't have it figured out. So we're definitely not gonna figure it out in 15 minutes, but you have lots of resources to help you. There are so many resources to help you with managing noxious weeds, many of them in this room. Um, I would really encourage you to take this home with you tonight. Um, weed management on small acreages in Montana, and it goes over all this integrated weed management in a lot more detail. So it at least is a good starter for you to take home and do some study so that when you come to Kalina, um, you come to me, you come to your other, the conservation district, Dale, the wheat district, you, you come with a little bit of knowledge so that we can visit with you um, on, I, it's telling me I should be done <laughs> in a friendly way. But take this home with you and we'll talk more later. Thank you. <laughs> so right into our fourth presentation for the night, we have John Sidaway. He's a retired NRCS state range conservationist and he's gonna talk about pasture and grazing management. Okay, uh, good afternoon. We're going to talk a little bit about grazing management. Um, first couple of things I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through pretty fast, but I think it's things you need to be thinking about all the time, like uh, the natural resource planning process and the steps you should be thinking about, as well as those ecological processes that we're trying to maximize or get to a high level. So, um, uh, I was going to say, Jane, 25 years, mine's been over like probably getting close to 35, and I'm in the same boat. <laughs> so, I know what you mean, but it's still fun every day because you're seeing new things all the time. Okay, uh, I guess I need to change this. Isn't... Okay, so the initial planning steps um, would start by uh, trying to develop goals for your property. Uh, identify concerns or problems. Inventory the resources, find out what plants are growing out there, what the condition of the soil surface is. Uh, then we need to analyze that information and we might find new issues that we might need to uh, address. And then we need to develop alternatives to solve those resource issues. Um, and then uh, make decisions to address uh, the issue and then implement a plan of action. And then we want to make sure that we're evaluating the success over time. So this should in keep, include yearly monitoring of one form or another. Um, and then we need to change the plan if needed um, to meet our uh, planning goals. And that's just the conversion of uh, light energy into chemical energy in the plants. Um, good energy flow is going to be a high proportion of broadleaf grasses and other plants, a high density of plants per unit area, vigorous healthy root systems, and good aeration and perme permeability of the soil. When we have poor energy flow, we have a high percentage of narrow leaf grasses out on the landscape, usually a, probably a lot of annual grasses. Um, spindly and shallow rooted, low plant density, and greater area of bare soil. And we can't have compacted soil and low organic matter. But we generally have pretty low organic matter in our native rangeland anyway, but just a little change from three or four percent to two or one percent is a pretty big jump on native range. Okay. Water cycle. The goal is to keep a maximum amount of moisture on the soil surface and to allow for maximum infiltration through that surface and then good percolation down through the profile. Key to improving the water cycle is soil surface management. I want to keep a lot of litter there and uh, decrease the temperature so we don't get that evaporation. And then the runoff as well. 
Um, effective precip is more important than total precip. And that's just talking about that localized area there on the soil surface. Is it well covered? Is it minimizing the evaporation? A good water cycle. Um, you have adequate litter and plant cover with deeper, healthier root systems. Soil surface permeable, soil well aerated, low percentage of bare ground, uh, water runoff is low, uh, both droughts and floods are less severe, and then your underground water supplies have the potential to be replenished. And then conversely, um, your poor water cycle, soil surface will get sealed or capped, very little litter cover and plant community has shallower roots. Soil below the surface more compacted and aeration poor, water runoff high. Both droughts and floods can be more severe. <clears throat> Underground water supplies not replenished. Our nutrient cycle is ma maximizing the availability of nutrients to the plants. Healthy environment for soil microorganisms. Soil surface management is critical to have a functioning nutrient cycle. So our good nutrient cycle, um, we're going to see increased plant cover and litter, increased root mass throughout that profile, plant residues in contact with the soil surface, rapid breakup of dung and plant residues, porous soil rich in organic matter, healthy population of microorganisms, and bare soil is minimal within the plant community. Poor nutrient cycle inversely has poor plant cover, litter cover, root mass diminished throughout most of the profile, dung and plant residues not readily, readily incorporated into the soil, poor envir environment for microorganisms, low organic matter contact, in the soil and deep minerals lost to cycle and plant communities. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and go through a stocking rate example. And the first thing we have is the um, our animal unit equivalents, and there's a lot of different uh, animals I know out there that small landowners have horses. Some of them will have a, maybe a steer or two that they're going to. Uh, butcher later and maybe sell a little bit to somebody else and then keep the rest. Um, goats, sheep, and uh, look around my house in Ennis, I've got lots of meal there. So this example here um, is showing that the thousand pound cow with the calf up to four months old, and I've seen it range between three to four months old, three to six months old. So it's going to take uh, like five meal deer to eat the same amount of forage as one uh, cow with a calf of six months of age. It's still <laughs> like three elk. We got elk like at 0. 0.7. 0. 0.7. Yeah. That's for a mature yeah. uh, cow. Yeah. There, the one other thing, I'd, there aren't many thousand pound cows in it. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. So what do we do with that when we're calculating? You you gotta you gotta yeah. raise that. Yeah, for every hundred pound increase you go from one thousand to eleven hundred, you get point one. Yeah, right. yeah, that's a good point. Okay, let's say that I have twenty acres of dry land pasture. I got a mix of native rangeland and, and tame um, pasture, and to me that's always been introduced forage. Um, something like uh, intermediate wheatgrass, pubescent, could be alfalfa, sand flame, or a mix of those, or a lot of other combinations as well. So from the clipping and weighing I, I've done, I calculated I've got a thousand pounds of forage per acre, and uh, I want to emphasize that forage means it's either desirable or preferred by the animal. It's not things they won't eat, okay? Um, so for all of my 20 acres, I have 20,000 pounds of forage. That seems like a lot, doesn't it? 
And while I bar smoke consume, um, I put 988 in this example, and I wish I would have put more. This is more like uh, oven dried weight. So air dried weight would be up around 1150 pounds. But there's really no need to get into the numbers so much right now. So to calculate an initial stocking rate, I'm going to take that 1,000 pounds that I've got, air dry forage, and per acre, and I'm going to multiply by 0.3, which is the harvest efficiency. Because um, you're going to leave 50%. That's a given. I'm going to take half, leave half concept. So we've kind of taken that away. And then we're going to be, you know, peeing and um, dunging, and we've got grasshoppers and other wildlife eating it. So realistically, we've only got, um, instead of that total 20,000, we're down to that times 0.3, really, realistically. And that's 300 pounds per acre from that 1,000 pounds. So 300 pounds per acre divided by that 988 that I'm using gives you 0.3 AUMs per acre. So on my 20 acres, I have a total of six AUMs. OK, that six AUMs, remember, we got 1.25 animal units for the horse. And, and that's pretty conservative. It probably could be a, a little higher than that. A lot of horses are, are big, too, bigger than uh, you might think. So we divide six AUMs by 1.25, and that gives me 4.8 months to graze my 20 acres. And if I have three horses, I, I'm down to 1.6 months to graze. And that's proper grazing, by the way. So if we look at intensity, frequency, and timing of grazing, the intensity is just looking at uh, how much is been removed during a grazing event. The frequency is how often those plants are grazed over a period of time. And then the timing refers to the time of year plants are grazed during the growing season or when plants are grazed in a planned grazing rotation. And this is just a graphic that shows grazing period short to continuous, um, recovery allowed, long to none. And you can see in a short grazing period, we still got good root growth, quite a bit of leaf growth. And then as we get into longer, we're getting to the point where if we graze it like um, 50 to 60%, our, our root growth is going to stop at that point. And then continuously grazed, um, if that's done every year, um, right here, uh, then you're probably going to see that grass die. And then you're going to get things, you're going to have to call Jane about these new weeds. <laughs> okay. So, um, grazing management considerations. When do I start grazing during the growing season? This time, of, um, the time of year in southwestern Montana where we start grazing is usually earlier or can be. Um, you know, one of the things we've done or tried to do is get out after the cheat grass early on, in early April, say, and then try to get off. We might have to come back one more time. That's an even better way to do it. But you might not have the time. You've only got a window there where your native plants start growing, and you don't want to be grazing them at the same time when they're only, you know, so, so tall. So, um, the cool season grasses like uh, Blue Bunch, Idaho Fescue, you're looking at, you know, first part of May that they're starting to grow. And then uh, the cool seasons go into a dormant state once it gets 85 to 90 degrees uh, over a period of time. Whereas the warm seasons we see more in eastern Montana, um, they'll grow later, you know, in the growing season, but they'll continue to grow. Um, all the way through the summer, even in the hotter temperatures. Okay, so try not to keep animals in the pastures too long to avoid grazing individual plants multiple times or grazing regrowth. 
plants need time to recover. That is really the most important thing. We don't want to keep grazing those plants time after time during that same grazing event or during the growing season. Neighbor stocking rates may not be applicable to production after a drought year or consecutive drought years. So we need to change that over time. You know, the, the initial stocking rate that I came up with, that's just a guide. It's not set in stone. We, we need to change those as we get changing conditions over time. Um, do I need more fencing to manage grazing so that I have multiple pastures? That might be something that you decide to do. Um, and we can talk about that maybe with some of your questions. Well, I decide to move animals into my corral at some point during the day and for how long? And how much hay will I need to feed my horses during the year? And then do I have adequate water? And then uh, I'm getting to the end here. Please. Okay. Um, and take time during the year to do pasture walks throughout your your property to identify plants, observe stubble heights. Uh, after grazing, evaluate the soil surface condition. Watch how your animals graze and what they are selecting. You should really get a good idea of what's growing on your property. Um, at least one year, day a year, address a monitoring plan where you take photos or do uh, something like <clears throat> cover measurements. You probably can get away with doing cover measurements every five years, but I would encourage everybody to take photos every year. And then the monitoring will aid in the plan of action for grazing the next growing season. It'll also help you see how well you're doing with your resource plan effort. And then control eliminate invasive weeds. Man, that's huge. Got to do that. And then fence repair. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, John. So we're going to end on the topic of soils. And we have Clayton Markser. He's going to be talking to us. It's the first person you heard from tonight, and he's the NRCS soil conservation technician from the Sheridan Field Office. This is going to be more interactive, um, playing with the tool that the NRCS has, so you can use it at home. NRCS is the Natural Resources Conservation Service. It Here. is an agency within uh, or underneath the United States Department of Agriculture. We primarily work with private landowners, and the motto is helping people help the land. In Montana, the way conservation is put out, we have technical assistance and then financial assistance. Financial assistance, assistance comes through various forms, but it's farm bill funding. And a lot of what we do is through the EQIP program, Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Now we'll get into that more if I have a little bit of time. It will run on there if that works okay for you. We're going to try this because it's hard to see the screen. I think we can make it work. Now everything that everybody's talked about today, especially uh, Jane and then John with his range management, all boils down to the soil. Everything in our lives boils down to the health of our soils. Our agency was started during the Dust Bowl because of unhealthy soils. And this is a tool that has been developed over many years. It used to be a giant book that was your soil survey. Now it's online and it's available to the general public. Anybody in here can use this and find out the basic information and even really deep information about their individual soils. So when you go to the web soil survey, you just put it in Google, this is what'll come up. In order to get the map pulled up, you gotta click the green button. I'm gonna refresh, see what happens. There we go. Okay, so this is what comes up. And the first thing you're gonna need to do is figure out where your property is. There's a couple of different ways to do that. You can use the map function uh, and the little zoom in and, um, this does not have a clicker, so I don't, there we go. And you can just keep doing that and zoom in on your area. But the fastest way is probably just to put in your address. So I have a sample property I'm going to use here because I, I know the owner. And we just had a conversation yesterday about 
what he's really seeing on the ground. Uh, I think I got his address right. He's my father, so I should. Lane. Oh, it's Lane? All right. So I should know. I'm glad you know his father's address. Okay, so I'm going to center it just a little bit here. So to manipulate your map, there's these little toolbars right on the top. Now, I apologize if this is a little off because I'm in a pretty severe angle here. So right here in the center of the screen is his hay field. We want to zoom in on that a little bit more so that when I draw my area of interest boundary, I can be pretty accurate. Once you have your map where you want it, over on the right, there's two boxes with red shapes on them. Um, those are to draw your area of interest. You, one just does a straight um, square or rectangle shape, and I'm going to do polygons so that I can follow the actual shape of his field. You just start clicking, and in here I'm just going to follow as best I can the edge of where he actually harvests. Oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> now, once you get your shape complete, just double click. actually going to zoom out just a little bit so we can see what comes up here. Okay, now we have our area of interest loaded into the system. There's a lot of different things you can do here. If you click the soil map tab, you can see the names of the actual soil. And then if you click on each one of these, it'll pull up a window that gives you all the details of that soil, what the water holding capacity is, what the drainage is, uh, depth to restrictive layers like bedrock. In the interest of time, we're going to just go straight to the Soil Data Explorer. And there's a few tabs in here. This one, Suitabilities and Limitations for Use, is the one I use the most often. And I've used this outside of my job. Um, I've used this also for people that I knew that were looking for property and they were asking me for advice or what I thought about it. I'd go in and pull that property up on web soil survey, figure out what the suitabilities were before they proceeded with their purchase. I will say that on these topics that are structural, like building site development, the ratings that you'll pull up, they come in not limited, limited, and very limited. There's no absolutes because engineering can overcome a lot of soil limitations, but we're gonna focus on vegetative productivity. So he has, scroll down so you can see the map here. We're going to go look at yields of irrigated crops because he has a wheel line on the field and grass. He's got a grass alfalfa on there. So we're going to select grass legume hay and then view rating. So this will populate a map. It'll have color coding on the on your area of interest. And then as you scroll down, you can see the different types of soil and what their ratings are as far as what they will produce. Now, it's important to realize here that these ratings that you will find in Web Soil Survey, those are optimal conditions. If your soil is in its optimum health, that's what you could expect to see out of the crop on that footprint. However, I have yet to see any soil that in reality is optimal. So, when you're looking at these and you're seeing what, this is what the potential is. This is not what may be actually on the ground. So 
we did a little calculation last night and I don't remember the exact number that I came up with, but it was just under three tons per acre of what, around three tons per acre is what is optimal on this whole field. Dad gets anywhere from two tons to two and a half tons per acre on the field, depending on the year. And one of the things to keep in mind here, there's a story behind all of these soil conditions. They bought this property like 11 years ago. And when they bought this property, it hadn't been, let's say managed optimally, and it was covered with knapweed. So one of the first things they had to do before they put in a crop that they wanted to feed their animals was to deal with the weeds, as Jane and John already talked about. And most of the time in the situation like this, to treat the weeds quickly, you're gonna use herbicide. Well, herbicide, it targets types of plants, not necessarily certain plants. And after you treat a bunch of weeds, you may have a period of time where your soil kind of has to recover and rebuild, depending on how severely damaged the uh, ground was. He treated the weeds and he ended up seeding in some alfalfa into the grass. Did you do a mix or just alfalfa into the grass? I did some, uh, some mixed grass and also some uh, annual rye. And he's, you know, he's probably getting to the point where you need to reseed the alfalfa. Yeah. But um, but his production has come up. He's he's been re, he's been rebuilding the organic material in the soil, like John was talking about. The organic material feeds the microorganisms underneath. And one of the things he's going to try to avoid when he puts in his soil is or puts in his seed, he's going to try and not till it. Because anytime you turn over soil, all the microorganisms that are underneath that are protected, most of them die. And so it takes a while to rebuild that uh, organic material and those microorganisms. Now you can offset some of this with fertilizer, uh, whether it's biological or synthetic fertilizer. Um, but another thing I'm gonna show you, so that was the yields of irrigated crop. Let's say that that isn't irrigated. Let's say it's one of these subdivision lots that a lot of you may have that is range ground. It doesn't have, oops, I went too far down. It doesn't have irrigation on it. We're gonna look range production normal year. And one thing I would say here, any time that you're doing any sort of planning as far as what the available forage will be, never, never plan for the good years. Uh, always plan for normal, but drought is pretty normal around here anymore. So. Uh, I never, I never even look at the favorable year because um, you don't want to plan on that. So now the ratings are a little bit different. Oh, I didn't click the rating. So in John's presentation right before here, he talked about stocking rate and how to calculate that. The way you figure out how much grass your, or forage, I should say, your ground actually produces, the very best way is to have somebody that is familiar with range management come help you do a clipping and weighing, which is you go clip the plants that are there, you let them dry, and you weigh them, and then you can figure out exactly what the forage is. But in this case, you can do this on Web Soil Survey to figure out what the optimal condition would produce in pounds per acre per year. And then you would do your calculations as John was talking about where you take half, leave half. So you don't wanna graze it down to the dirt because then the plants won't recover well and your invasives will come in. So you wanna leave half the plant standing. Um, that's a generality, but this is a good way to find that. And then once you have figured out what it was that you wanted to see, and you, you can do a couple things with that to make it usable. You can click printable version. It'll come up and it'll ask you to put a name on it and you can just print it out right on your computer there. And it's basically just printing what is on the screen, the map, and then the ratings down below. Or you can do, let's say a soil report. So if I wanted an official looking soil report, 
I would come to this tab, go back to vegetative productivity. Um, I'm just going to do the quick one here. Now, add to shopping cart. I'm going to let you guys know right off the bat, everything on this website is free, so don't worry about having to pay for anything. Um, I'm just going to type grass just so I have something in there. You can label it however you want. Once you put it in the shopping cart, you go to the shopping cart. And check out. I'm going to do get now so we can kind of see what comes up. There's a lot here, but it's it's uh, very thorough. What will come up, it includes your maps, it includes all the ratings, but it also includes what the soil survey is. It includes how they came up with the data, how they identified the soils, what every, all the qualities of all the soil. Clayton, there under custom subtitles, can you name your field then? Yes, yep, you can name your field. There's another, it's not going to let me open another window just because of our technology, but it comes up with a, a really official report. Uh, it looks really good, got a cover page on it. Um, and I'm down to a minute. So uh, I guess the last thing I would say, because I've got a minute, everything that's funding wise that's coming in through NRCS is through Montana Focus Conservation, which is a targeted way to address actual soil resource concerns rather than putting a pivot here and a fence there and a stock water over there. We're really focusing on the resource problems and then creating a plan to address those. And we've got a couple different targeted implementation plans in Madison County right now. But for this audience, for the people that have smaller acreages or maybe even live closer to town, we're working on some other options uh, Sarah Leffingwell, she was the gal that signed you in. She's putting together a targeted implementation plan around pollinators. And pollinators affect everything. So there's going to be some opportunities to possibly do some tree and shrub planting. And then if you have areas or pastures that are really degraded, come in and reseed those with species that are beneficial for pollinators, but they're also beneficial for grazing, um, wildlife, and the soil itself. When we build a targeted implementation plan, it has to get uh, through the area office and the state office and get ranked against all the other plans in the state for funding. So the best way that we can have a success in getting one of those approved is by having people ready to sign up for it if they're interested. So if you're seriously interested in what I just talked about, please talk to Sarah when you get done and she's got a sheet and she'll take down your information and maybe we can get this pushed through and have a targeted implementation plan that will fit most of you in this room and your properties. There, there's another one called the high tunnel initiative that will fit uh, pretty much anywhere, anywhere where you can fit a high tunnel. Thank you, Clayton. If folks have questions about navigating this website for their land, can they call you? Yep. Stop. Yep, absolutely. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a five minute break, get up, stretch your legs, use the restroom. I would like to see that table of snacks empty. <laughs> and then we're going to reset and bring more folks up in addition to the speakers for open Q&A on the topics you heard about or other topics. And so we'll introduce folks that are more local resource. Part of the reason we're all up here is that I just got around the room as we're recording this. Hopefully be able to share it in the future. People have questions or new residents move in and we've got a, an owl set up down there. So that's why we're trying to have all the question answerers up front. So Julie, the first speaker had to leave. So if you have wildlife questions for her specifically, we're going to write them down and get them to her and make sure your questions are answered, just so you know. But maybe we'll just start on the other end and folks who weren't on the panel or weren't speakers can just introduce themselves so you know who we're, who we're talking to. Shrink it up. Oh, shrink it up. Okay. Hi, I'm Carrie Strassheim. I'm the regional manager for the DNRC Water Resources Office out of Bozeman. We cover Madison, Gallatin, and Park Counties. I'm Dale Gross. I'm the lead coordinator, Madison County. Don't be Mark, sir. Land use planner. <laughs> uh, Andy Folks. I'm a hydrogeologist with the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. 
So focused on groundwater type issues. Mike Duncan, I'm a fisheries biologist with FWP. I cover the Madison and Gallatin drainages. For those of you on this side of the hill, Matt Yeager would be your biologist for the group. John Sidaway, retired uh, NRCS range pilot. John Wagner, uh, district conservationist for NRCS uh, covering Madison County. This is in Sheridan. And Jane Manhold, um, MSU Extension and Mason Plant Specialist covering the whole state, but I partner with Kalina more locally. So. The TV star. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. <laughs> Montana Egg Live for those of you that don't aren't familiar with the program on PDS. I'm um, Blake Marsher, NRCS, and Sheridan Field Health. So we'll just open it up to whatever questions you folks have. We have until seven that we planned, and then you can get on the road or stay and kind of collect resources and connect with us individually if you want and continue to snack. So who's, who's up first? We'll start here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Steve Delisi. I just moved here. Well, June 30th. And I have 40 acres of land, which is primarily covered with sagebrush. That's from the house. What do I do with it? <laughs> I, I, I don't have horses. I don't have livestock. I'm just what I treated for weeds this year. Um, I don't know what's out of that sage other than mule deer and rabbits and things like that. I mean, should I patrol that to look for weeds? Is it okay to just let the sage go? I, I mean, I've heard some of it around the house because of fire, but I'm new to this. It really comes down to your goals and, and what you want to see on your property and what you want to do with it. Grazing is a wonderful tool to help manage sage step resources, um, but the 40 acres, you might just find a neighbor that wants to bring some cows in for a short period of time and then move them on. Um, also, wildlife, if you like having wildlife on your property, a lot of wildlife like to come in and eat the succulent growth that is left after cows or whatever other species, but most times cows have eaten the standing dead forage off. So that, it really comes down to what do you want to do with it? But the things you already mentioned as far as I'm concerned with controlling for weeds. You already know one of the things you need to be doing, and I would say learning your plants. Thanks. Nobody's talked about uh, availability of water in a situation like yeah. what he's got. That and that's that's typical in a lot of smaller acreages. Is you might what your things you can do are limited by your water source and availability. Or an animal. And your fencing. I don't know if it's fenced or not, but if I could offer one one suggestion, observation I've made through the years for you, and that is if you want a diversity of animals to be on your place, you need a diversity of plants. So if I mean if you wiped out all the sagebrush, there's gonna be a lot of different animals, wildlife species especially, that aren't going to want to be there. It might be great for grazing with domestic animals, but it might not be attractive. <clears throat> you look around the area, if you really just think about it in general terms, diversity of plants brings diversity of animals, and diversity of animals and plants brings diversity of people. Yeah, and you can arrest uh, places too long, and they'll go downhill just as fast as if you overgraze. So, uh, I don't know what what your feeling is about having you know grazing animals on there, to, no. just for a short period of time. Oh, the, the ranchers come up and graze. Oh, okay. in the spring, June, June, June time frame. But you're good with that, right? No, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I didn't hear anyone talk about this, but the number one problem that we have where we live on a Sheridan is that just exploding population 
of ground squirrels, oh, gophers. Yeah. And um, our place is really being damaged pretty seriously by their presence. And I think I've read everything you could possibly read about getting rid of them. But um, and we're not out to exterminate them, we just want. <laughs> Any ideas on how to nearly exterminate them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we didn't. You wanna? Well, go ahead, Queen, and then I'll add if you're not gonna say this. If I'm not gonna say the same thing you are. So we didn't touch on that topic tonight, but we do have a wildlife specialist at MSU, and we also have the Department of Ag has a specialist who's out of Lewistown who has a lot of maybe the resources you've already read. One thing that I could offer is to come out and do a site visit, take photos, walk the land, and learn what your goals are, you know, over a period of time, and then be the eyes and ears on the ground to relay that to some of those folks. Yeah, you, you were at our, our, at our place earlier this spring, but we were in a different pasture where we don't have too many mm -hmm. of them. These are coming in in more of a drier side of our land. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, you're I'd be happy. Having that up. Sure. Yeah. The Department of Ag specialist is his name is Stephen Van Tassel. So if you haven't read his materials, he's the best resource I think we have in the state. And sometimes he's looking for sites to test methods. So he might be might be someone that you and Kalina would want to reach out to and, and yeah, see if he has suggestions. Good, yeah. Kalina, Matt's Smelly Ranch Line Group. We've got things scheduled for coming in next spring. Okay. okay. So um, that would be really good. So we're trying to do it early. Linda, could you stand and introduce yourself? Because so, I think you're a valuable resource for a lot of these folks. I'm Linda. I'm the project director for the Madison Valley Ranch Line Group. We say Valley, but we work with the Centennial Valley Association, Ruby Valley. Um, we're just trying to be keep ranching viable, productive ranching, open spaces, and healthy wildlife and watersheds. So we did. Uh, we partner with a uh, wildlife series, and the people that came to our snake savvy this year wanted. It's not going to be part of the wildlife series because it's not friendly necessarily, um, but it will be on ground squirrels, and it will be early spring. Okay, yeah, that's great. So I'll try to make sure if we have the connections, we'll get everyone notified. We have some flyers for the Madison Valley Ranchland group in the back on the resource table. Okay, thanks. I would just offer one other thing on ground squirrels. Some people have a hard time exterminating them because they're kind of cute. But when they start destroying stuff, that kind of goes away. But if you don't do anything about them, they will get to a point where they will eat everything, yeah. um, put a lot of holes in the ground, but also maybe even worse when they get to a population. Nature has a habit of handling stuff if we haven't handled it well and disease will go through them like crazy, mm -hmm. but you don't want that because then that disease is on your property. So. Well, one of the, the real issues is also the kind of a cascading effect of badgers coming in and all. Yeah. Yep. 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 Go from a little hole. Yeah. Badgers on the front Buildings. Yeah. Love to burrow under the corner of mm -hmm. your building. You know, I've got spots where the land had sunk, and I didn't know why. Near my garage. Almost lost a propane truck there one time. Um, there, there's something you need to deal with, I think. Are, are the gophers on uh, native rangeland, or is it hay ground? This is hay ground. Uh, um, it's grass. It's grass. It's native grass. Grass um, with alfalfa. Anyway, they weren't an issue five years ago. They were more an occasional one, but to be droughts coming in. Our water table has dropped. Now that has accommodated their their dams essentially. Yeah, we I used to have water within three feet I of the had, surface. I'm sorry, I've had guys try putting in uh, perches every so many feet on the 
their uh, pay ground. I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest that a sage grouse habitat. Just a place yeah, yeah, for the hawks and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's you know kind of mixed success, but help somewhat. And you get raptors on your. I mean, who doesn't like seeing little harriers and fox and prairie falcons? And that cat thing is a whole different topic. <laughs> Julie's not here. <laughs> Other question yeah. on anything? Okay. So, in that same subdivision that Steve lives in, that's where I live, and it's approximately 450 acres with 20 parcels or so. It's perimeter fenced, and I understand that Montana is a fence about state, a more open range. What about within that subdivision? It's a private subdivision. If we have one person that wants to get a milk cow, does everybody else in within the boundary have to fence out that one milk cow? Yes. The answer is yes. Or, or we have to, is it legal? Well, maybe I don't, I, this is a lawyer question. Maybe can can the subdivision create either a bylaw or a covenant that says no livestock or no cows within? So. Yeah, yeah. Covenants for subdivisions are utilized for specific details such as that. Okay. Um, they are not enforced by any agency other than an active and recognized HOA that has to be recognized with the state. That's the kicker. So they wouldn't have any legal backbone unless. The HOA is a state recognized organization. But yes, you can amend bylaws for your HOA. It would probably make most sense to have that in a covenant or a covenant document, but yep, you can. And that's you know, also pretty have, common. You can also have the requirement to fence in. Yes. Say that again. Yep. You could also have a fence in requirement. Yep. Oh, okay. In your that is good in your, Yep, in your covenants. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. In our HOA, 360 acres, <coughs> five properties, all some are twofers. Do you know what a twofer is? Mm -hmm. Two people have spent two million, they're here two weeks a year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of very large areas or the chair range grass never been touched for years unirrigated what should we be doing if anything i mean it's talk about golden fields of range grass that goes everywhere go ahead john <laughs> i i would find a way to graze it or um, you might have to start off with uh, mowing it first to get all that old growth out of there. We do have some blizzard like berries from all the fire protections. Oh, a lot of sagebrush there too. No, no. It's dominated by. It's wild right? Is it getting grazed at all? No. Like, is it decadent? Like you know, what kind of grass? Yeah. But I mean, some <laughs> well, in the absence of having the facility fence and stock water available, you need some disturbance. You're kind of left with mowing it or burning it. It's a valuable right time of year. It's pretty helpful. Yeah. And the entire HOA is fenced. <laughs> No fences. Nice thing, though. I mean, if you're amenable, you could always set up portable water tanks and move it around because that would move the cattle around too from place to place. Where, and you just fill it from your, you, it wouldn't be a huge amount of cattle, so it could handle a smaller water tank. Remember, I said an HOA of two first. That's right. <laughs> Well, someone's got to be taking care of their place once in a while, right? Yeah, I can see the feed also. Anyway, we've got no. Do you know what? It's a valuable question. It's real. Mostly annual grasses or like 
grass that are cheap grass or what kind the of native grasses or yeah, I'm going to say it's native grass. Almost looks like early wheat. Got seeds on the tops. It's all about that tall. Same kind of principles apply though. Once it gets so tall that nothing wants to eat it, it's just there. We have a similar situation with uh, big areas of the native grasses. We have very little fencing. We do have uh, a, a irrigation, uh, but we've had people come in and it's too big an area to fence to have someone's horses come in every now and then. And it's been suggested to us that we do do some kind of controlled burn. Is there an agency on this who might help us do something like that? If that's kind of a last resort, or how do you all feel about that as a solution? You know, we, John just said, doing nothing is almost just as bad as overgrazing. You're going to end up with nothing. So a couple things going on there. Anybody <laughs> else on the panel can chime in. Okay. We have 70 plus years of smoky bear saying all fire is bad. Exactly. And in places that's very applicable, but also it's created a, a fear in people of any fire at all. And this whole area was fire adapted and much of it was, was every 20, 30 years. Um, fire is a great tool, but back to the everybody's been afraid of it. There's just now, starting to be a lot of conversation happening about how do we start putting fire back on the landscape in smaller controlled ways so that we can prevent big disasters from happening with fire but also it's super good for the soil so that card doesn't have anybody <laughs> on it that so none of you all specializes <laughs> in that yet we're all talking about it and there are some folks that are talking about trying to get started with a private burn control association type deal where private landowners work together, get resources, but it's in the early stages. Okay. We put a call with maybe your local fire department yeah, or the forest service. We the fire department. Um, sometimes forest service yeah. needs something. I used to work for the forest service. I fought wildland fire. Sometimes they need something to do. Sometimes they need some training and small projects like that could be just what they need. I used to do prescribed fires with the BLM out in eastern Montana. But you know, you've got to have the right window and the right people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the DNRC fire folks get into prescribed fire at all or uh I know they I, know I think in partners, yeah. Fire person. <laughs> I think it's partnering with local fire departments and training like mentioned that. Yes, sir. How about we issued my wife and I issued a large subdivision, most people here probably familiar. We had a tremendous problem with weeds. Um, so, one of the purple flowers. That, 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 was, that was such a big kahuna. <laughs> we finally got rid of the napweed, mostly by use of chemicals. Eventually, we had a landscape that was filled with these bare areas, but the napweed was gone. Then the cheatgrass moved. Mm -hmm. Cheatgrass took over every bare spot, and now the cheatgrass is filtering through all of the land that we used to own. We now live in Venice, where we have minimal weed problems. The reason I bring this up is I'm seeing cheatgrass all the way to Bozeman, beyond the area that's being sprayed by local jurisdictions, maybe the county, maybe BLM, because there's a variety of ownership between oh, the Madison Valley and Bozeman. But if you look through the hillsides, particularly earlier in the year when the cheatgrass turns uh, uh, reddish color, you can really see it. I see that as a huge problem in my town. And I'd love to know what I'm looking at you because you're the weed guru here. I agree with uh, everything you're saying. You say, what is going to happen? Yeah, we don't have an easy solution. I, I mentioned that I was up at the last two days, the Invasive Species Summit has been happening in Helena. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the tasks of our summit was to identify like the top list of species, invasive species to 
be working on an annual grasses rose to the top, mm -hmm. one of the top three groups of species. Um, we don't have easy answers. It's a it's a combination of things. It's early, you know, finding those patches early and managing them. It's proper grazing. It's um, limiting disturbance, maintaining healthy vegetation. Uh, we don't have biocontrol for it, um, probably herbicide applications combined with seeding, desired species again. And the models uh, uh, concerning changing climate um, indicate that most of Montana will become more and more susceptible with uh, warmer winters, warmer springs, and hotter summers and possibly drier summers. So I don't have a good answer. Um, I spend 95% of my time talking to people about annual grasses and, and researching ways to control them. And we don't, there aren't any easy answers. Um, what I've been telling people to do is if they find small patches on their property to manage them while they're small. And we do have some very effective herbicides for doing that. But the real problem is the large Land yeah. on BLM, North Western, there are parcels all the way to Bozeman that are very, yeah. very large. Some of them are grazed, some of them are. I, I don't see any solution for that. It just keeps spreading further and further from the highways where it's been trouble on the highways. That's easy. Yeah, yeah there, there isn't an easy solution. And we're, like I mentioned, we're mm -hmm. We're facing a climate that's changing to make our landscape more conducive to annual grasses. They've been a problem in the Great Basin for <clears throat> 100 years. Um, and the Great Basin is still doesn't have a good answer for dealing with them. They increase fire, um, the risk of wildfire, and which is one of the biggest things I think we need to be concerned about, especially, you know, the audience we're visiting like tonight. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. It, I'm as concerned about it as you are. So, I, I, yeah. am, I have an observation. Dale can probably address this too, but uh, for years in the Blacktail, when we first started getting a nap, we just come out of recreational vehicles that's where it stems from it starts scattering off the county road <clears throat> early on the primary herbicide used was kill i mean tordon and i i absolutely would not let them use tordon after about two years because we created this habitat for these animals because the tordon kill everything and it was a perfect opportunity for the animals to come back. So then it's a lot of the newer herbicides to use on these invasive weeds uh, don't do that. They don't cook it. They're more selective. Yeah, yeah. they're more selective. So, yeah. But that doesn't change the fact that we've got the existing problem we've got to deal with. But that is really one thing we talk about in the invasive plant world is secondary invasion. So we spend our time keying in on knapweed or leafy spurge or toad flax or horiolisum, you know, whatever it might be. And we do a good job killing that, but then the annual grasses are what come in. And I don't recommend, the only thing I ever recommend people use Tordon on is leafy spurge in the right place. Yep. But we have other herbicide choices for dealing with these other noxious weeds that are friendlier to our other vegetation. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was told by my weed sprayer years ago that the only thing that killed cheatgrass also killed everything. It, it just was bare ground after the <laughs> and can't replant because it's on a hillside. So yeah, is that, that still true? No, or is there not. herbicides we, that will kill cheatgrass? We have herbicides that will be pretty selective with cheatgrass. Um, I'll mention Ventanata as another annual grass that's spreading quickly across Montana. The, the timing is really key, and most of those applications are like in the fall, because cheatgrass is up now, right? Yep. If you have cheatgrass, you have this carpet of green seedlings right now, 
and now is the time to be treating those or maybe two weeks ago <laughs> or a week ago i sprayed cheatgrass last thursday friday before the snow came but yeah but we have we have options that are better than they were 20 years ago yeah. oh, it wasn't that long ago well <laughs> 10 years ago yeah, the time when roundup was the only yeah. yeah for the sake of this conversation and the recording and applying it to those of us who are in this room and small acreage owners a lot of this goes back to the sheet grass annual grass conversation goes back to how you manage your 20 acres or your 30 acres everybody wants to have horses some want to have milk cow whatever but the horses especially just because you've got 20 acres doesn't mean that you can run three horses on it and the more that you graze that overgraze your pasture you create the conditions for annual grasses so i could encourage people to do one thing out of this is really look at your management of your acreage and in terms of livestock and grazing grazing is a great tool and grazing is something you should be doing if you can <laughs> but don't overdo it if you need to you know, have to have the horses keep them in the corral feed them hay have that acreage as a place for them to go exercise and run around and graze some but um, don't create the habitat for the invasive grasses yeah. oh. hi i'm <clears throat> i'm curtis Koenig. uh we live in white hall we are trying to not be city dwellers we're just uh, our, our brand new landowners so a lot of you probably are going to think that this question is stupid but um i i feel like in the interest of us wanting to keep montana such an amazing place uh conversations like this and the wealth of experience that you guys are bringing to this to help people like us i really thank you and applaud you you're the you're the difference you're the change you what's keeping this place so awesome to live um but as such you're talking about my question is about uh weed control um so Perhaps our weed control person could help us or you could help us, but um, you're talking about different chemicals that could be used, different herbicides. To, how do we find that out? Where do we acquire these chemicals? Dale! How do we, <laughs> do we have to hire someone or just we, we actually have chemicals in our shop. We can, and you live in Madison County? Yes. And we uh, sell chemicals to individuals. We tell you how to use them. We give Usually we try to give the best advice we can as far as what to use on what we use. So. Yeah, there's a cost, get and there's a cost the and that mm -hmm. of purchasing the, the chemical through them. It's really nice. Well, we don't, the even if you for. didn't purchase it through us, you still have, we have a cost share program, which really helps land owners. And Dale, do you have <coughs> equipment? Do you have sprayers yes, that people can some use? Some equipment that we ran well. out. We have a slide in tank going goes in a pickup. We got a 25 gallon tank that goes in a pickup. Uh, we have backpacks, but uh, we we can sure help as much as we can. What about the applicator's license certification process? For them? Yeah. Unless they use Tordon, they don't need one. Oh, Tordon's the only one. Yeah, Tordon's the only one you need. Oh, okay. And where are you located? In Oliver. I've got a follow up question to that in regards to like you were to have it professionally sprayed. I just happened to notice like it was like, oh, five to fifty dollars an acre or something like that. What is the average? Because we've had we have a lot over here in Virginia City that's less than two acres. Um, but um, and so we're happy to have the weed spray, you know, or I'm trying to do it myself, but, you know, I bought some stuff from True Value and after reading the cautions, I was like, no, nope, I'm not. <laughs> so, and it was 23 pages. And so I was like, that's not for us. So what is like the average cost? Cause then, you know, like, I was like, oh, under two acres, whatever, for the past few years, we've paid about six to $700. And it's so, all very requires how many weeds you got on your property. Okay. Uh, Everyone charges a little bit different. Okay. You, know, you have to talk to your commercial applicator and see what their base rate is. Okay. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of uh, a lot of variables. Variables. Okay. Fair there's enough. There's a number of real good ones in the area too. Okay. 
really good feel. Very yeah. Say what I did in my place was I had three different people come out and take a look at it. Okay. Give you an estimate for what it would cost to treat it. You know, if one's out of the ballpark, well, they're. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have go. any idea. It was just brand new. And then we have some other acreage out there, which is, you know, but, um, uh, and then a follow up question we did on that same parcel here in town. Um, someone asked, you know, it had horses. Oh, can we raise our horses there? Blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. Not know anything about um, horses. And so they overgrazed it. And so my question is without any water available, it's just here in town. Um, there's not city services there. I mean, it's throwing out seed and they're that feasible at all? What would be the processes to that? I to guess. establish more seed? Is that what you're asking? No, I think, yeah, just to, I mean, those There's horses. Okay, I, know, I thought they were going to be there for like two weeks. They ended up being there for like two months. And biologically, horses have top and bottom teeth and yeah. they chase the sugar. Yeah. So instead of like a cow browsing around, grabbing it with their tongue, they snip it off right Yeah. Through. So a hard one to use for controlled grazing. Um, and if this Felina be, might have some good tips on this because she deals with a lot of small landowners that are probably in the same situation. Do I have good tips? <laughs> 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 this is pollinator seed, or that's going to do nothing if there's it's not irrigated at all, and we don't have the possibility to irrigate. Has it, it only been done once? Yes, it was only yeah. done once, and she asked again, and I was like, "Wait to that's see what that's happens when the growing season." See what happened in the spring. Okay. Yeah, I'm just okay. Gonna wait. We let it go this that was last summer. And we if didn't you have a good winter it might come. Yeah. Was it in pretty good shape before the grazing? Uh yeah, I think so. You know, it was something that we just bought and Yeah, yeah I think really that's good advice though, way because you could have cheat grass there and seeding probably isn't gonna do you just okay. be a waste of money. The one thing that you'll want to look at. First thing when growing season starts, you just go out and walk it and see how much just exposed soil there is where okay. there's there's nothing. You, there's not a sign of a plant. That'll that'll determine a lot. Just a general comment in basing this on some of the questions and um, give yourself time with property nature doesn't very quickly i mean she moves at a different rate than we want to move, you know your your comment about your you know sage and you've been there since june june like give yourself a year or two to kind of figure out what's going on out there yeah be looking for weeds you, you're doing the right thing and you're totally doing the right thing to be at this workshop and you want to do something you want to do it right but Part of that is giving yourself some time to figure out what's happening out there. And I think, John, and you're, you talked about monitoring, the importance of monitoring, is paying attention and being observant. I mean, this is your chance to be a naturalist, yeah. right? <laughs> Observe and make notes and figure it out. Well, we couldn't take questions. There was probably questions all night. But we did make this meeting from five to seven. We have to cut it off somewhere. If there's more questions, I encourage you to please get in touch with these people before they walk out the door, get their business card. Also, definitely take advantage of there's a table full of free handouts there. Uh, Code of the New West is something that the county puts out. If you're a new landowner or if you live here and you've never read that book, you ought to. You've got tips for everything. Um, the conservation districts are great resources, and they haven't really gotten to talk tonight. Um, earlier, uh, Julie had brought up carcass composting. Um, the conservation districts can help you with that. Madison Valley Ranchlands can help you with that. If you have livestock on your small acreage and one of them dies and you just don't know what to do with it, that is an option. Um, so get a hold of them, find that out. Plus all your 310 permitting questions like that. They do a lot of different projects with pollinator plantings. So I don't, they help put this on. So I don't want to leave them out. Rhea, as a district representative, would you like to say anything? I thank you guys all for coming. And I also want to point out that Steve Orr, he's our 310 specialist. He's here today sitting back there. So if you 
apply for a 310 permit. He's who you will have to deal with. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, that's all, though. We have been from Ruby Valley Conservation District. Yeah, I'm on the Ruby side. Um, like Clayton said, I mean, we have a resource for a few things, and we can also point you to the right people. We have like pollinator seed for people, the carcass composting program, you can come volunteer with us. Uh, yeah, lots of stuff. Um, at the conservation district. Um, I also want to point out, because nobody asked her a question, I was told somebody was going to be asking lots of questions about water rights. That person didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> Harry's the pro at that, so if you have water rights questions, definitely check with her before you leave. If you have groundwater questions regarding wells and that kind of stuff, Andy right there in the middle, he's your man. Science. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Mike. He didn't get to talk yet, but um, if you have questions on fisheries and stuff like that, he's got to talk to. Um, please, please fill out the survey and let us know what you thought of this. It'll help us figure out if we should do this again. Absolutely. How frequent and what things we need to focus on. Um, so there, there's copies of that on the front table. If you're interested in, in what I talked about with a NRCS pollinator tip or high tunnels or whatever, Please see Sarah, she's back row. She's got her hand up. She's got a sheet. She can take down your name and information. Um, I also, it, sorry, um, the survey, we have hard copies here, um, but also if you signed in, I'll send out, out a follow-up email with a link and you could take an uh, online survey if that's easier for you, so. Um, just please join me in thanking all our speakers and panelists. <laughs>